I would like to acknowledge that this video is being filmed on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or First Nations people who may be watching this video today. Hi everyone, it's Steph here. This is The Novelty Corner and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I have a Books Beside My Bed video for you, which if you're new here is a video I film every week where I wrap up the last seven days worth of reading. This is my reading week from the 23rd until the 28th of April. I read 10 things this week, including binge reading a series because it was the last weekend of the holidays and I fell down a rabbit hole. So, you know, this happens every now and then. Those 10 books equated to 3,957 pages and my yearly reading total is 195 books for the year. All right, so we're gonna jump straight into books because we have so many of them. The first book that I read this week was a book that an author sent me for review called The Rose Volume One by P.D. Aleva. Aliva. And this book is a dystopian sci-fi horror story. It has a really interesting setup or premise for the book because we're set, it's set on Earth and we're kind of in this post-World War thing. Like there's, there's been a war going on and the US has been invaded and we start in the perspective of a woman named Sandy who is heavily pregnant and she's hiding out in a building in a town that's currently being occupied by the invading force. Her hiding spot is found out and she ends up trying to run but then she's captured and she's delivered to the actual people behind this invasion who are not actually people but they are some kind of strange alien vampire type species. And they live deep underneath the earth because they need to be closer to the core of the earth. They're vampires but they're not your traditional vampires and I know when I was reading um, the author's notes that the author was you know sort of coming up with their own genre and using elements that were familiar but then twisting them into into different ways which is definitely the case in this book. What we do find out though is that these alien vampires are kidnapping pregnant women and experiment doing genetic experiments on the babies and they're trying to create some kind of hybrid alien human vampire baby thing and in this case they're successful and it's what the consequences of what the birth of Sandy's child means for everyone. So this is very dark, it's very violent, very bloody. There are lots of paranormal elements woven in here so you have these vampire-like creatures, you also have things that are similar to lichens. You have witches and you have telepathy and you have a whole host of things going on with the competition between these races. So there is a second volume that I have that I will be following up to see where the story goes. It was really interesting. This is completely outside my comfort zone. It's probably not a genre that I would pick up myself, but it was very interesting to read. Then I began my uh, rabbit hole descent down into Sophie Lark's Brutal Birthright series and I read all six books over three days because yes, obsessed. The first book in the series is Brittle Prince. This is Callum and Ada's story. So we predominantly follow two main families, the Gallows, who are the Italian Mafia, and the Griffins, who are the Irish Mafia in Chicago. There are different players who become involved in later books, but mostly we are following the siblings in one of these two families. So Callum is the oldest son of the Griffin family. They are, you know, traditionally enemies with the Gallows, and Ada is the youngest and the only daughter in the Gallo family. And after a run-in that Ada and Callum have, their families or their fathers get together and they decide that the best way to settle this is to have an arranged marriage between the two of them, which the two of them are not thrilled about at all because they can't stand one another. So this is an enemies to lovers marriage of convenience romance where the two of them just constantly try to one-up one another. They're just constantly niggling at each other. But it was great because there is always such a good payoff with this, especially when the characters begin to realize that the other person is smarter than they think, uh, more useful than they think, uh, exactly the kind of person that they need, but they just didn't recognize that because of their preconceived notions. So that one was really fun. Then I read Stolen Air, which is the second book in the series. This one is my second favorite book in the series as well. This one follows Nessa Griffin, who is the youngest child of the Griffin family and she kind of has nothing to do with her family's Irish Mafia business. She is a dancer and she has just started choreographing 
ballet shows and she's really good at it but she's not really receiving acclaim for it. Sorry there was a slight technical difficulty but in retaliation for something that happened in the previous book the current head of the Polish mafia Mikolaj ends up kidnapping Nessa and taking her and locking her away in his gothic mansion on the outskirts of Chicago and the whole thing is deeply atmospheric and very Beauty and the Beast and I just loved it and just seeing Mikolaj who is this very driven determined very traditionally a very devoted mafia man begin to fall for this basically a fairy-like sunshiny woman is delightful. The third book in the series is Savage Lover. This one follows Nero Gallo who is one of the sons from the Gallo family and his relationship with Camille who is a woman in town who he went to high school with. She currently works in her father's garage. She loves fixing cars. She's fantastic at it. Camille ends up being blackmailed by a police officer to become a confidential informant when she doesn't really want to do it and she ends up getting caught up with this guy who deals drugs and she doesn't want to be involved but she really has no choice. This forces her to cross paths again with Nero and the two of them have this passion for fixing cars, for classic cars. They love, there's drag racing in this book which was really fun. They begin to become closer and this one was particularly interesting because Nero is described as being the more psychotic of the Gallo brothers. He's the one who gets sent out on enforcer jobs. He is the one who comes up with harebrained plans all the time. And he never thought that he would fall in love, but he falls for Camille. Bloody Heart is the fourth book in the series. And this one follows the oldest of the Gallo brothers, Dante. He's a former soldier who's come back to work for the family. But this book actually opens when he is a teenager. And this is a second chance lovers to hate to lovers romance with a secret baby thrown in there for good measure. So we start when he is a teenager and we actually start in the perspective of the heroine Simone who is the daughter of a diplomat and she is in town and she and her family are out at an event and she doesn't want to go inside yet and she waits in her family's limo and she's the only one in it and Dante happens to be on a job for his family and he's on the run from the cops and he happens to jump in the front of her limo and steal it to get away from the cops not realizing she's in the back seat until she pops up and then the to have this conversation and she doesn't feel threatened or unsafe with him and eventually he comes to find her again and the two strike up this relationship that they know their families wouldn't approve of particularly her family they really don't care until Simone finally takes Dante home to her family and it goes horribly horribly wrong and even in spite of that they don't want to give each other up they end up sleeping together and then something else happens and Simone is sent overseas and we what we find out is that she's pregnant or well, she's overseas she's still only a teenager she's only 18 or 19 at that point and Dante never finds out about this baby and then we jump forward into the present day where the rest of the series takes place Simone is returning to Chicago because her father has an event in the city and he's asked her to be there and it just happens to align with a, a job that she's got lined up she's now a model she's famous around the world and for this event Dante has been hired by the Griffin family to support the security staff and this is the first time that they see each other again and that's when someone takes a shot at someone on the stage and they don't know who is the target and so Simone and Dante end up joining forces to investigate it because they are concerned that it could be her father that has been targeted but it could also be someone else on the stage. Throughout this you eventually have the reveal of Simone's child. I will say something about this particular book that or a couple of things. First of all Simone has an older sister who passes away through the course of the book. Also Simone's family took her baby away from her when it was born and it was adopted by her sister. They didn't but they didn't even tell her that that had happened because she got really really sick in hospital and so she was devastated by that. So she was still in her child's life and the child does know that um, Simone is their mother. That kind of bothered me and then also Dante's reaction to finding out like I get it but it felt very over the top and one-sided and that bothered me a little bit because Dante was the most level-headed of the Gallo siblings and I thought the response was disproportionate to the way that he's been so rational so far. So just be aware of that going into it. My favorite book in the series is Broken Vow which is book five and this one is the story of Riona Griffin who is the middle child of the Irish Mafia family and Raylan who is a character we actually meet in the previous book because Raylan is a friend of Dante from when they were both in the service. So Riona is a lawyer so she's her family's lawyer she's very good at her job she's incredibly capable and she's incredibly independent and 
The book opens with her being attacked in her apartment building and nearly killed by someone who is lying in wait at the bottom of the apartment complex's pool and they try and drown her, which is a terrifying thought. And I only mention that because I could, mm, drowning is something that just gives me a spike of anxiety. So if that's something for you, just be aware that that's right at the start of the book. It's not a spoiler, it's just how we open. Everyone is really concerned for her and so Dante calls in his friend Raylan to act as a bodyguard for her because there's no one else that he trusts better to take care of her because they're friends. And Riona is really put out by having this shadow who is a really laid back casual guy. He's, you know, he's the sunshine to her grumpy and I was all here for it. Raylan for his part pretty much worships the ground that she walks on. Like he finds her so fascinating and he enjoys picking at her to get a reaction because to him she's really predictable in the way that she responds. And then when these threats begin to escalate he ends up taking her back to his family's ranch and this is the total last place on earth that she thought she would find herself. She's not suited for it in her mind but she ends up you know befriending Raylan's family and getting used to life on the ranch and working with the horses and all of that. And this book is so hot. Their chemistry just leaps off the page and I absolutely adored it. Hands down, my favorite book in the series by miles. And then the sixth book in the series, unfortunately, was my least favorite and this was Heavy Crown. And this follows Sebastian Gallo, who is the youngest of the Gallo brothers. We've seen him the whole way through the books and I was so excited for his story because in the very first book he's you know playing college basketball but then he is injured in this interaction with the Griffins and it totally destroys that career. So we knew that he was going to be on this sort of weird spiral thing. I think this book just it, it spiraled in a direction that I was not expecting it to go and I wasn't a huge fan of the heroine in the story. Her motivations for doing things I don't know how you overcome that. Even though I like, I, I genuinely believe that, you know, for her character, she shifted her perspective and she realized what she wanted to do. She is the daughter of the head of the Russian mafia and they basically entrap Sebastian into a marriage. And then a lot of people are injured in the crossfires of basically an all out war between the Italian and the Russian mafia. So there's a, there's a lot going on and I just, I wasn't expecting it. And also in a lot of ways, it felt like a setup for the Kingmaker series, which I'm gonna be up, up front and say, I actually don't plan on reading that series, not because I don't think it would be well written because I, I think, you know, binge reading six of Sophie Lark's books in three days means that I, I like her writing. I'm not a fan of bully romances and I know that there are at least two books in that series that feature that because the Kingmakers are all the children of these characters and some of the other and one of the other series I think. I'm just not interested in the kids. I would actually rather see more of these characters but that's just me personally so I, I won't say never say never but I don't have any intention of continuing the Kingmakers series at this point. Anyway moving on. I then picked up a young adult graphic novel This is the Greatest Thing by Sarah Winifred Searle. This was sent to me by Alan Unwin for review for so thank you very much to them for that. It is a chunky graphic novel. And this one follows Winifred who is in year 10 and just struggling. She's struggling with body image, she's struggling with her identity, she is really struggling with managing friendships and in this story she ends up becoming close friends with Oscar and April but even they have their ups and downs because they're all going through different things. You have topics around anxiety, around around gender identity, around sexuality and Winifred is trying to cope with a lot of things through creative writing and she ends up create and she ends up co-creating a comic and then creating a zine with her friends as a way of sort of trying to work through some things. So you have comics within comics in this book. It's quite a heavy young adult contemporary story but I think worth reading and it was really interesting to read the author's note at the end as Sarah talks about how you know this is very much her high school experience. So there's always you know a level of gratefulness for reading someone else's story, something that they chose to share with other people because they hoped that it might help others to realize that they're not alone. So this is a really interesting graphic novel if you're looking for something for teens. Then I read Mars Awakens by H.M. War. This was another review copy sent to me by Alan Unwin. It is a middle grade science fiction story set on Mars. You have two opposing colonies and we meet two characters, one from each of these camps. You have Dee and you have Holt and they end up going out to investigate something that falls and crashes onto the Martian surface. This is the first of two books and you have these two characters trying to figure out why their two camps don't communicate with each other, why one is more advanced and why one is less advanced and what could possibly have crashed onto the surface. So it was a 
very interesting and enjoyable read. And then finally this week I read How to Love a Duke in 10 Days by Kerrigan Byrne. This was a really fun historical romance story. I think Kerrigan Byrne consistently so far like the two authors that I've loved for historical romances have been Tessa Dare and Kerrigan Byrne so I think I'm just going to continue down that path. This is the story of Lady Alexandra Lane who as a young woman is sexually assaulted and raped by the headmaster of the school that she is attending and in self-defense she ends up killing him and she and her friends end up burying him quite literally and burying the murder and that becomes their secret and then we flash forward to the present day in the story and she is traveling to meet up with her friends particularly Francesca who is about to become engaged to a duke and when she gets there Francesca is not happy about this. As it turns out Alexandra has unintentionally already met the duke and they have this connection and so in order to save her friend from being married and also to solve a problem that Alexandra has herself she proposes a marriage of convenience to the duke who also has feelings for her and he agrees and so they end up getting married. Then of course he finds out that she is not a virgin and she had never made any insinuation that she was, she, that it had not come up. And he reacts in a way I thought was a bit uncharacteristic in terms of what we'd known about him so far. However, he's concerned that she proposed this marriage of convenience because she's already with child and that she's going to try and pass someone else's ch child off as his own. And so he refuses to sleep with her again until after she's had her period. She's kind of devastated, but she kind of gets it. But it, of course, it affects the fact that, you know, she still has a deeply rooted tra trauma from her own sexual assault. It takes a little while, but he eventually figures it out. And I actually thought that that part of the book was one of the most fascinating and heartbreaking scenes when he realizes that in his inability to listen to her he has made her relive something. Granted you know he didn't know about it but he made her relive something incredibly traumatic and he hates that he did that like he absolutely loathes it. So there I mean it's a heavy it's a heavy historical romance. I mean Kerrigan always does some interesting things with sort of darker themes. I actually really liked seeing how Piers came to that realization and then the horror that he has that he has in any way caused her greater harm than she's already experienced and I don't think we often get that in stories like this and I appreciated that. So those are the books that I read this week. In the comments I would love to hear if you have read any of those books and what your thoughts are on them or feel free to share something that you have been reading in the last seven days. If you want to let me know that you're here but you don't want to leave a comment feel free to leave a crown emoji down below otherwise I hope that wherever you are in the world you're staying safe and healthy and I will see you in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye everyone.